sense of uh, drowning of sorrows, I'm sure, with that score. Yes, 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 yes. I just wish that one of Sun's corporate colours had ever been the appropriate colour for me to wear. Anyway, now welcome again. This is day two. Uh, we are proudly hosted by the Queensland Brain Institute. Uh, and I will just mention our platinum sponsor, Frontline, who have helped put this on. We're very grateful to them. They are running this competition. Uh, please enter it. Uh, they would like to get entry. Event sponsor, Open Solaris and Sun. Um, Deidre here, who's operating the camera, is actually from the Open Solaris community group. So we were streaming yesterday and we were recording as well, but with the streaming we had no less than 20 people watching it all through the day, which I think is pretty fantastic, especially since we hadn't actually advertised it. Um, yeah, but it's a competition. Uh, and we don't need to do the building safety instructions again, I don't think, because we did that yesterday. One small housekeeping matter, um, one uh, Dell looking laptop for a Dell, right, right, okay, well, it'll be, it'll be with me. Uh, now, we are really honoured today to have Professor Perry Bartlett, who is a Federation Fellow, but most importantly, he is the Director of the Queensland Brain Institute, and he's down here at the front, he's uh, going to t say a few words. Um, we're really glad that you're having us here, and thank you very much. Yep. Uh, well, thanks, uh, thanks, James. I, I mean, for, for the I mean, a special welcome to all the uh, overseas visitors and to uh, and to the Sun uh, uh, Microsystems people. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, to host you and to welcome you to uh, Brisbane and Australia. I, I'm a little uh, a little upset to hear that you've only seen only seen some of the culture. If you went to the uh, rugby last night. It's uh, it's one of the minority sports of this, uh, of, of this country. In fact, there's a much larger football called Australian rules football. You can tell I'm from, from the south rather than the north, which is watched by about five times as many people around Australia. But nevertheless, uh, a biffo at rugby is probably better than, uh, oh, I don't know, a cold bath. Um, anyway, when I, when I heard that uh, we were hosting a kernel uh, conference, I immediately thought of the fast food industry. and. Uh, but uh, you've probably heard that joke three or four times before. But um, in, in many ways, uh, this institute was established to really work on kernel problems. That is, basic fundamental problems that uh, regulate brain function. So the institute uh, was established uh, some five years ago, and we only moved into uh, this new building about 18 months ago. And uh, when we set up this uh, building, or when I came to set up this building, we really stood back and said, how can we address the uh, enormity of uh, the tsunami of neurological and mental ill health in our community, which accounts for about 45% of the burden of disease in Australia and the US and in most countries. That is dementia, mental ill health, uh, um, uh, the whole range of gamut of disease accounts for days lost due to premature death or to uh, time from off from, uh, uh, from work for about 45% of that burden. I mean, far greater than anything to do with, with cancer or heart disease or any of those much better known and well-funded diseases. And we stood back and said, well, the reason we haven't really understood how to treat those diseases is because we don't know how the damn kernel works. We don't know how the brain really does what it does. And then essentially, we study what you guys work on. That is, how data is, uh, is, uh, is stored, uh, how it's uh, acquired, acquired, stored and retrieved. So those questions we're addressing at very fundamental levels of, uh, of neuroscience, using animal systems from Drosophila, from fruit fly, all the way to humans. Drosophila are amazingly intelligent little animals. They learn very regularly and you can use the genetics of Drosophila to find genes that regulate that. Uh, and even humans have some intelligence which we can, we can learn fundamental things from. These people, we've, we've uh, put them side by side. In fact, on the third floor of the institute, we have guys working on Drosophila, guys working on human, and guys working on honeybees. In fact, just across uh, the road here in a building, on top of the building across the road, we had the world's biggest uh, in, uh, house uh, in-flight uh, uh, bee house 
which uh, costs an enormous amount of money for a few bees. But again, bees have a wonderful system, as you know, of finding food and remembering where that food is and transmitting that information back to the hive such that they can fly out and find it again. So this very eclectic approach to trying to understand these basic systems of the brain is what we've built at this institute. And allied to that, of course, the big question is how we take that data, which I'll come back to in a minute, which is an enormous, enormous voluminous amount of data, and build computational models that we can then test uh, to see whether this is the way the brain works or not. So again, I think uh, you know, we have a, a, a sense in common of trying to fundamentally understand the system uh, and, uh, and, and take those fundamentals into uh, aspects like trying to promote learning. You know, as you know, um, learning in our community is probably the, the least understood uh, thing. We talk about education, but education and learning are, are vastly different enterprises and most education really isn't linked to learning at all. So we're trying to drive these studies into fundamental translations into, uh, into education, into retraining, but also, as I said, into terms of fixing those disease processes, many of which we think are fundamentally just breakdowns in the, in the system. Let me give you a couple of snippets of things which, which may interest you about the way we learn, the way we acquire, uh, acquire data in the brain. It's very interesting in learning, one of the key, key things that we need to do as humans is to pay attention. Now, your, your, your mother always told you this, that you need to pay attention at school. Well, it turns out it really is true. If you don't actually attend to something, that information somehow doesn't ever get consolidated in the brain. I mean, there's some wonderful, wonderful examples of this. I could show you a video of a, of a basketball game and ask you to concentrate on the guys throwing the ball and count how many times uh, the ball is thrown by the black team versus the white team. I'm talking about guys in shorts, not the colour of their skin. Um, and at the end, I'd come back and you'd all say, yeah, it was thrown 10 times and 20 times. And I'd say, would you see the guy in the gorilla suit walk through the middle of the court? Now, probably one of you here may have seen it, but 99% of you wouldn't have seen it because you were not attending. You were attending to something else. And then when you re-show really the video, it's very obvious. This, this person's just walking straight through the middle of the court in a gorilla suit or an umbrella or something. So how, how that attention is focused in the brain is one of the biggest questions. It seems that we top-down select the information coming in. It doesn't actually seem to go anywhere. And it's a real mystery. Although it hits the back of your retina and must get transmitted to the brain, most of that visual information is non-retrievable. It's not even clear it gets stored anywhere because somehow we're able to select that information coming in and only allow certain amounts of, 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 it to be, uh, of, of it to be stored. I mean, it's a very vital question in terms of how attention is, uh, is regulated in terms of those things of, of memory and learning. The other thing we're doing, uh, and again, this involves a lot of computational and also robotics people, uh, is we're trying to work out how navigation works, uh, how you find your way from from your car back to your car, where, where you leave your car keys. These sorts of memories that go in ageing populations, and I don't have to uh, uh, tell you, although most of you are young, you're not going to suffer from this in the near future. If we all live to 100, about 70% uh, 70, 70 of us are going to suffer from cognitive decline, from uh, some, uh, some form of ageing dementia. And some of you may well be living to 110 uh, in, uh, in when it comes around, and almost 80% of you probably will be suffering from it. What we're starting to learn is that navigational skills that usually go early in these ageing dementias is um, this part of the brain that, that uh, codes or where that information is coded has several interesting properties. One is that this information is coded by uh, connections between nerve cells and they're not hardwired. These connections change in strength and, uh, and can be altered quite, uh, um, uh, quite readily. In fact, one of the features of memory and storage in the brain is that it's a very plastic process and in fact the plasticity underlies the memory storage. But one of the things that we've been working on for the last 20 years is in fact you actually make new nerve cells in the adult brain and even in the old brain like mine. In this part of the brain that stores memory for spatial memory, especially in some short term memory, you're continually adding new components, new nerve cells into there. And it seems the data is looking very strong and, and some very new data I can share with you. If you stop the production 
of new nerve cells in this part of the brain, you in fact inhibit animals from learning spatial memories. So if you put them into a maze where they learn how to navigate based on visual cues, they aren't able to learn or retrieve that information. So it seems that, that the addition of new nerve cells with their properties uh, which are quite different from the old cells, they tend to make connections more easily, fire more easily, that is integrate new information more easily, that uh, this is a mechanism by which we constantly are able to update our spatial memory. Now the good news for old guys like me is that um, although it, this runs down as you get older, and this is the theory we're, we're, uh, we're following, that uh, it's, it's the rundown in the system that leads to this dementia. It's not a pathological process, it's more of a physiological ageing process, but the, the, the hardware is still there. That is, the cells that make these new nerve cells still reside there, and we're getting very close to know how to reactivate those cells to make these new nerve cells. So there, there's hope at the end of the uh, line. I'm, we're working very hard before I uh, get much older to try and solve that, that problem. So, so um, storage of, of memory in the brain is it's a very plastic process. Not only have you got wiring changing and connections changing all the time, but you also have this addition of even new components which seem to have uh, special properties. So, um, uh, as I said, the Institute is, uh, is uh, built around these processes and built around uh, trying to uh, get information from various aspects and obviously interacting with computational people to build models to make sense of this information. The other, the other thing that's going to revolutionise neuroscience in which you guys, uh, the interactions that uh, the capacities you're building, is to be able to look in very fine detail within the brain. Most of the things we know about the brain have been learnt from, from animal studies or animal studies in, 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 in vitro, in test tubes. We haven't really been able to look inside the living brain and say what that ner nerve cell is doing to the next nerve cell. MRI at the moment is phrenology. You just see one part of the brain light up when you think about X or Y, but it's not telling you anything about how it works. It just says perhaps this part of the cortex is involved in that sort of activity. But imaging is getting to the stage, certainly in mice, and we have one here, that can image down to a single cell, a single nerve cell in a living animal. So we're starting to be able to interrogate individual properties of nerve cells and image those properties and look what's happening in real time in, in these animals. And of course the amount of data that's being generated here is just absolutely horrendous and uh, certainly our storage capacities are something that we're, uh, we're very, very excited about being able to be involved with Sun to develop. The other thing that's going to happen is that you have 10 to the 12 neurons in, in, in your brain, but that's a big number, but even more complicating is that each one of those nerve cells can have up to 10 to the 4 connections. So those con the number of synapses, the number of connections is just astronomical. But so, so trying to understand how the firing pattern within your brain relates to a memory storage or, or, or retrieval or a, or, a, or a coding of some recognition is a monumental task and we've only been so far able to record from about 10 to 60 electrodes in the brain and try and fundamentally try and work out what those electrical recordings mean in terms of behavioural function. But it is going to happen with nanotechnology that we're going to be able to put in hundreds of thousands of electrodes into a living brain and retrieve that story. So we may get a much fuller picture of what's happening in terms of recognition and retrieval of information. And again, you can imagine the amount of, the amount of data that's going to be generated in it. Just an unbelievable amount of data. So neuroscience is really at the level of being totally dependent in the next 10 years of being able to integrate imaging data, electrophysiological data, molecular data, the rest, into some form of neuroinformatics to try and break down what that code is for recognition of learning and memory and encoding those properties in the brain. And I think without both computational uh, modelling and ability to be able to store and retrieve this information, the field is going to be uh, held back greatly. So I'm, I'm extremely excited that... Uh, that uh, Ian and, and Jake and the Institute have, have, uh, have been uh, uh, developing with, uh, with, with you guys uh, the capacity to uh, set up some of these storage uh, capabilities. And I, Ian, uh, Ian and Jake have given me some figures here about uh, our capacity and saying that uh, we have 15 billion files under management, which 
probably as meaningless to most of you guys. Uh, it, we have the uh, 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 one of only two organisations integrating Sun and Apple equipment across all functions of our business. The other is a Japanese bank. I hope we hope we can change. Uh, uh, we can interact with them more often, Jake. We can use their files as well. Um, uh, we we uh, we also uh, um, uh, Jake and, and Ian have, have been very actively interacting, and I hope we can develop that further. I mean, I see here Ian says that we're hoping that we may become a Sun Centre of Excellence, and certainly, for, uh, from my point of view as director, I will help in any way possible to make that that come about. Uh, Ian's also written at the end of uh, my little briefing sheet here, and he says all this is done largely done by two of our IT staff while they also fix microscopes, repairs people's email, restart Word and Firefox and answer questions about iPhones. Well, that's pretty true and, and I, although the IT staff, as you, as you would know, you never get praise from anyone, um, you only ever get uh, rung up because uh, dumbos like me don't know how to restart the computer or something, but it's true. I mean, I'm very proud that, uh, that Jake and Ian have developed uh, a wonderful IT system within this, uh, within this uh, institute and. Uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that becoming a very integral part of, it, of going forward in the neuroscience development. So once again, I'm extremely happy to have you here. QBI is extremely happy to host you and we hope we see a lot more of you and perhaps an involvement in some of those uh, things we've been talking, I've been talking about over the last five minutes. So welcome once again. Thank you. Okay, guys. Oh. Thank you very much, Professor Bartlett. Uh, okay. Is that uh, audio coming through all right? Right. So, uh, next up, we have Sherry Moore. Sherry is delivering the talk that Max Alt from Intel was going to deliver. Because, uh, well, like I said yesterday, um, they wouldn't let him fly. They said, well, stay in this room and we'll monitor your temperature and fever like symptoms. So, um, Sherry is staff engineer, senior staff engineer, surely. Yeah, senior staff engineer has worked on the Solaris 10 projects to actually have X64 support. So without her, it wouldn't have been done anywhere nearly as good. Um, yeah, and she's done a whole heap of stuff just throughout her career at Sun. Uh, the thing that I'm, that, that really, I find most beneficial, I mean, apart from having X64 support, uh, is that she made a really small change to the way we um, compile out stack frames so that when you debug a crash dump, as Pramod was referring to yesterday, you can actually see the stack frames. So, you know, we lose a bit in terms of, like, you know, with GCC it would be F emit frame pointer. We don't do that because um, then we can't debug things and that makes life as a support engineer, which I'm not now, but I used to be, incredibly hard. So with one fell swoop, Sherry decreased the time it took to analyse crash dumps on X64 by about, I don't know, 50%. So I think that's cool. Anyway, here's Sherry. Hello everybody, can you hear me okay? So uh, clearly I'm not Max, but I, I dressed the part, did you know this? <laughs> I'm typically an engineer, I'm in jeans and t-shirts, so, but I figured it wouldn't do uh, Max justice if any of you have met him, he's always in the shirt and the suit. So, um, so it's a uh, it's actually kind of interesting. I offered to James before this conference, I said, I can actually talk about the Intel and Solaris Alliance because guess what? I'm actually, I actually wear the hat of the TED leads of the Intel Solaris project or Solaris project on Intel. And, then, and James was like, nah, we already got somebody. So I was like, oh, now I know who it is, see? <laughs> see, it's all meant to be, believe it or not. So, let me see how to... Uh, Q9, F9. Clearly, it's not my laptop. Okay. 
so, so I, I saw these slides and uh, about at five o'clock this morning. I woke up at five o'clock this morning. I looked at the slides. So I might need to um, actually skip a few of them because uh, there are about 36, and I think it's up now. I have half an hour. But I will first of all tell you a little bit about the Intel processors and servers. Why it is so cool? Why Sun would like to align with them? And second. What is, why is LUR so cool? Why does Intel want to do anything with us? And then we'll move on to the actual um, collaboration that got kicked off around to January 2007. And since this is a technical audience, I'll move on to all the key development areas. Uh, I'll actually walk through most of the stuff which is actually done by my team, um, the ones that I'm familiar with. And uh, you can stop me any time, and if there's a particular subject that you are more interested in, feel free to interrupt me, and I'll go into more detail. And now, of course, you know, call to action. Since this, this is an open source project, we would like more and more people in the community to contribute, to help out, because honestly, there are only a handful of us at Sun, and we can only do so much. But with everybody helping, you know, there's no limit to what we can achieve. So with that said, let's move on to the first thing. The Intel uh, processors, actually, I believe he meant to say Intel processors. Can everybody see that okay? So do, do you all know what the 65 nanometer, 45 nanometer, and 32 nanometer mean? What exactly does that mean? That's actually, um, anybody? That's actually how close, do you see those really teeny tiny lines on the wafer? That's actually how close they can be and still without, uh, uh, in, what's the word, without becoming the same line. So the smaller that gap can be, the more transistors you'll be able to fit onto a wafer. I didn't know that I would be uh, talking, doing these slides. I usually carry with me this giant wafer so I can show everybody, you see those little lines? That's what the 65 nanometers mean. So before, oh, this is somebody just told me because I just came back from DC. And it's, uh, guess what? Now on a single NVIDIA chip, I'm, I'm sure it's the same with Intel, it has more transistors than there were on the, computer that ran Apollo 11 that landed us on the moon. So that's what this technology means. When the gap shrinks, you can actually put more and more transistors on the same wafer. And what can you do with those extra space when you can shrink the package smaller and smaller? What can you do with the extra space? You can put more cores, more cache, and more, even network. You can do network on the same chip. So this is uh, actually one of my favorite slides from Intel. Have you guys heard of the TikTok terminology? Yeah, so <laughs> some of this giggling in the back. So I actually love this. So t by TIG, that's a shrink in the packaging. That's really challenging the physic physics. So every year, er, actually it's every other year, they would shrink the packaging. And then off by one year, every other year, they would have a new computer architecture. So what does that mean to consumers? What does that mean to, to you? That means every single year, you can expect cutting edge technology coming out of Intel. It takes tremendous amount of planning, of organization, of focus. It's unbelievable. Not that I want to buy a new server every year, but I'd like to know that I have the option. So Intel is really cool. What does Solaris have to offer? So many of you who follow uh, Sun's uh, follow Sun in the 90s will remember that we spent a tremendous amount of time and energy and resources developing RISC um, large servers. So for example, the Sunfire Classic, the Sunfire 4800 to 6800, also known as the Serengeti the 10K, the 15K, all these are really big Spark systems with multiple, uh, multiple boards in the same chassis and then multiple sockets on the same board and then multiple cores in the same socket. 
So we spend a tremendous amount of uh, energy trying to optimize for systems with a lot of processors and a lot of memory and a lot large amount of I.O. So how does that translate into this alliance with Intel? This is their new Nehalem uh, processor, also known as the Intel Xeon 5500 series. So take a closer look. What does this processor have? It has quad core, four cores on the same chip. Each core has two threads. And all of these cores share the same, same L3 cache. So that looks awfully a lot like a Serengeti board shrink, shrunk in size. So what does that mean from the OS perspective? We already have all the code in place. And yeah, we, because uh, we have actually followed this one uh, design philosophy in slurs. Try to do it once and do it well. Like uh, Roger Fountner, who is the grandfather of slurs, loves saying, if you don't have time to do it well, when will you have time to do it again? So that's why we try to solve the problem once and we tune the operating system really well. So what this means is that all the code is in common uh, in the, in the common code area. So all the performance tuning that we have done for the large Spark servers are readily available for this uh, Intel processor. It's just a big NUMA system on a smaller scale. But this is really worth noting. So for all of you who have followed uh, Intel processors, you know that before there is a bus, front side bus based uh, processor. So what's the limitation of that as you grow uh, when you have more and more processors? Exactly, and that would limit the performance, limit the throughput. So QPI is their terminology. It stands for Quick Path Interconnect. It's very similar, I shouldn't say that, off the record, it's really similar to AMD's HyperTransport. It's a really <laughs> high speed interconnect. <laughs> But it's better, Bob. I, I'm sure it's better and, and different. <laughs> so, uh, so that provides a really high-speed point-to-point interconnect. So not all the process have to, to try to man, you know, try to master, get master on the bus, and, and then come in and then transmit. So, and anything else that's worth noting? I'll be covering those points over and over again. Actually, max slides cover those points over and over again. So if you have missed anything, don't you worry. <laughs> so clearly, we, we, we broke all kinds of records. We're you know, record holders of a gazillion benchmarks. So now we know Intel is a cutting edge you know, uh, hardware company, and we are cutting edge really good enterprise uh, operating system company. So together, we can rule the world. That's uh, <laughs> clearly, clearly what we have uh, in mind. That's what we had in mind in 2007, January. <laughs> so now, not, now that both companies have uh, realized that, you know, together we can do so much, we kicked off this uh, th this uh, co uh, cooperation. This That's actually a really, really cool poster that we did for the Nehalem launch. I think I can see my name on it somewhere. <coughs> so I have this poster outside my office. I told everybody, if you have worked on anything on Nehalem, come by uh, and sign the poster. We are going to, you know, we are going to put it everywhere and, and show people what you have done because this is a true, co you know, cooperation between the two companies. So if you have, uh, later if you, when you get the slides, or even right now, you can see that's the chip and we just drew off everywhere saying, see I did the fast reboot and somebody did the uh, IOMMU, IOH. So we, we really had tons of fun. We're really, really proud that you know, we have contributed and made this into a really successful story. So of course Intel would like to tell would like to remind us that they have contributed and consulted on all these areas. You know, it's not just the fun engineers, and we acknowledge that. 
I think most of you here are not, um, are most of you here familiar with our, our development model, how, what the relationship is with open source and, uh, okay, so somebody is uh, shaking their head. So the way we develop with Intel is that we have an Intel platform project under open source. So we have a project gate there, so both Intel and anybody who is interested in contributing and some engineers can all put back to this gate. Unless it's a hidden project, which means that it's something that Intel has not announced yet, so we cannot put it in the public. So you can see those purple ones here. You know, one is the Intel platform uh, project gate that's open to everybody. The others are the you know, hidden ones that contains Intel proprietary information that has not been announced yet. So once uh, we have decided that this information can be made public, and then we will put it back to open source. And then based on customer needs, actually Intel always, always wants everything, you know, back for this. So pretty much everything that we did is have customer needs and we'll pick those out and we'll back for them to the Solaris 10, which is the currently shipping commercial uh, Solaris. So this is our release model and it has been working really, really well. And I encourage all of you, if you would like to develop for uh, Intel, develop anything, just, you know, join one of these areas you pull over a gate and you can put back, we can bring it into the Solaris for you. We would love to see contribution from the community. So now we go into the more interesting areas. So we, I'll be going over all the projects that we have done together. And uh, some of them are more interesting than the others, clearly, at least to me. So uh, what are, what's our focus? So I work in the Solaris Core Kernel Group. What exactly are we responsible for? So we do uh, the scheduler, the virtual memory, and hardware enabling. So what, do, what exactly does that mean? What is scheduling? So when it, whenever you get a new system, how do you decide where to place uh, your next thread? It's really trivial if you have only one processor, two processors, you know, you have really nowhere else to go. But what if you have, like in the Halem chip, where you have uh, quad core, each core has two threads, when you have one thread that's running and then another thread comes in, where do you place that thread? Should you put them on the same core? Should you put them as far as possible? If you have two sockets, should you put them on the other socket? So all of these are the decisions are done by the, so the scheduler, also called the dispatcher. And that's one of the things that we spend a tremendous amount of time on. But as I mentioned earlier, we have already done a lot of work on our Spark servers, so the code is already there. However, we do need the information from the platform, from uh, basically the chip, showing us that uh, how they, all the cores and threads are related. For example, we need to know that CPU, virtual CPU 0 and 1 are actually sharing the same execution pipelines so that if I have two compute bound threads, I don't want to put them at the same, in the same uh, core because otherwise they'll be fighting with each other. And same thing if you have two sockets, if they are the same threads, if I have two threads who are sharing the same kind of memory footprint, I don't want them to put them into two sockets, uh, the different sockets, I would want them to have the same shared L3 cache so that all the memory uh, can be shared, yes. all the information can be shared. So the other one is um, NUMA. Once, when you have, when you first create a thread, you allocate a bunch of memory for it. And then later when you want to schedule this thread, where do you want to put it? Now that you already have a warm cache, you definitely don't want to move it to the other socket. So the, all those decisions are done by the scheduler and work with, working with NUMA, so for the CMT uh, architecture. So all that is done by the, by the core kernel team. And the next one is, oh, observability tools. That, that's actually one of my favorite ones. Uh, I, I, this uh, was a story that told me when I was in college. Uh, they said, this was uh, with AT&T because uh, at that time we had uh, AT&T over. And he said, uh, one day the customer called saying, you know, my system doesn't work anymore. Can you send somebody over? And AT&T said, no problem, they send somebody over. So this engineer, you know, came over, sat in front of the monitor, you know, looked at the, with a bunch of displays, typed one line of command, 
and poof, the whole system worked. And then this customer was like, oh, you're so good. I'm so happy. Thank you. Thank you. And how much do I owe you? And then the engineer wrote $100,000. So the customer was like, no way. You just typed one line of command. Why should I pay you $100,000? And then he said, give me an itemized bill. So he wrote, typing one line of command, a dollar. Knowing which command to type, you know, $99,909. So the moral of the story is that you, we would like to give our customer the ability to know what exactly is going on with, on the system so that they don't have to pay the $100,000 to, to just figure out what's wrong. You can look at, like using D-Trace, using CPU track, using all the tracking tools, you can figure out what exactly is going on with your system so that you can save your hundred thousand dollars and you know go out to dinner or go on a nice vacation or something. Compiler. So I think that the way that Max organized the slides is to uh, basically remind you guys over and over again. So I, I I saw slides later that will cover each area. So let's just keep forward. Okay, so this is a really, really good slide. I think this is actually a really good summary slide. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. So as I mentioned, QPI is their new interconnect that's really fast and point to point so you don't have to, you know, fly over, have all this bus contention. And that fits so perfectly well with all the whole NUMA um, yeah, NUMA optimized software schedule that, that we ha already have in place. So all that, all we need to do is to read the so-called SRED and SPLIT. I know those two words are, like sound so like like a gang language, SRED and SPLIT, you know. So it actually stands for like scalable resource allocation table or and uh, some such thing. But what those two tables <laughs> will provide is all the information of you know how far it is from one socket to another, how, what, what the memory latency is, so that we can use all that, those information uh, provided by the system to make really, really uh, intelligent decisions. So that's like a perfect, see, as you can see, we gained 28% performance improvement with that knowledge and without. Just shows you how critical it is to know, you know how far the other processor is. And the next thing is the integrated memory controller. As you know, before the memory controller is often Northridge. Everybody has to fly over it, you know, through the bus. So now the memory controller is on chip, so it's really fast. You're know, using once again using the point-to-point -point interconnect <coughs> to talk to another uh, processor. Yeah, it's red and split. So I think the first three all belong to the NUMA optimization. And the next thing is. Uh, you remember that picture I just showed you? It has core 0, 1, 2, 3. Each of those cores can actually be, the design is exactly the same for the, for the systems that you have on, in your laptop and the ones in an A socket server. The design is exactly the same, which makes it possible for them to have just this one uh, manufacturing pipeline to make all these chips. And they're all just, it's, it's a, like a plug and play. So, oh, you say you want it for, you want a chip for, a laptop here, you know, one core. You want it for your desktop, okay, two cores. You want it for server, okay, here, four cores. So if you want it to build a really big server, okay, here are eight cores. So that design is just really beautiful. It saves a lot of money too, so that you don't have to start from scratch saying, oh, I want a mobile processor, oh, now I need want a desktop processor. So I think Intel is really smart in that way. I'm really pleased that, you know. And, the, and it's the same thing like what we're doing with software because if you design the common parts really, really well, you only need to debug the problems once. So that same uh, design philosophy applies both to hardware and software. And there are a lot of, I have some slides, I don't know if I have time to go over it. For power management, we definitely have the most, uh, most intelligent power, so-called power where this battery in place now that, that saves a tremendous amount of power that um, works really, really well with the new Intel P and C state um, power management technology. With every new processor, they have to introduce some new uh, 
new instructions, otherwise, you know, why would people buy it? <laughs> but, you know, at this particular case, there's one instruction that's of great interest to us, especially the iSCSI folks. It's the CRC32 uh, instruction, because the iSCSI, the whole stack, they actually use that instruction, I mean, not that instruction, use the CRC32 functionality, functionality all the time. So we just did a really quick, at the time, as soon as we saw the instruction, we had the ISCSI team did a prototype to say, to see, you know, by using that instruction, how much power they can, uh, how much the CPU utilization they can save and bank 10%, you know, decrease immediately. It's, it's unbelievable. What that means is that <coughs> the CPU can just issue that one instruction instead of having this big long routine to calculate CRC32. So the CPU is not busy all the time. And when the CPU is not busy all the time, you can power it down so that it can save power. So that 10% decrease also uh, translates to a lot of power savings. So all kinds of cool stuff. Any questions? This is re repeating what pretty much what we have said. Microcov day. I actually would like to talk about that one because I actually wrote it. Um. So when you have a bug in software, what do you call it? It's just a bug. When you have a bug in hardware, what do you call it? <laughs> it's called an erratum. <coughs> or when you have many bugs in the hardware, what do you call it? It's erratum. I guess it's just like, you know. <laughs> That's a good one. So it's just like, uh, you know, well, if you are poor and weird, you're just weird. If you are rich and weird, you're eccentric. Exactly. So, uh, so why is microcode? Why exactly is microcode? Then why is it interesting? So when there are bugs in the hardware, it costs like millions, if not billions, of dollars to, to fix it, and the turnaround time is like months at least. So it, it costs a lot of money. So whenever there's a bug, the hardware people always ask the first question. Like uh, when I was working on this first project, when I joined Sun, it was the outro, uh, it's Cheetah. You know, we were bringing up Cheetah. And then we hit a bug, of course, during bring up in the hardware. And then the first question the product boss said was, is there software workaround? And my first reaction was like, what? That's like, like that's such a big hardware bug staring at you. How can you ask for a software workaround? And then he looked at me and he was like, Sherry, it cost $5 million to fix that in hardware. Do you have a software workaround? So we were like, yes, I guess we could have a software workaround. But <laughs> uh, that software workaround is uh, not that cheap either. We have to involve the compilers to insert this, uh, what instruction, a no op for like every seven instructions because every, every seven it will hit this stall. <laughs> so it, it's not a pretty workaround. But, you know, hardware engineers, they're really, really brilliant. They really don't have depend don't want to have dependencies on, you know, us not worthy, you know, software engineers. And also, like, companies like Intel, they work with uh, many, many BIOS companies, many operating systems. They don't want to ha have to rely on every single BIOS company to work with them and release a fix in the BIOS or the operating system. So what do they do? They kind of came up with this brilliant idea. A microcode. They have a little microcode ROM, really small. Basically, contains the hardware engineer's version of a software workaround. So that if there's a bug, they can give you this little little you know, microcode, and then you can just put it onto your processor, and bang, you know, the bug is fixed. And they don't even have to rely on you. So what I did was to, to basically allow the operating system to do that. And the reason that I think my implementation or the Solaris implementation is so much better than any other operating system's implementation is that we can do it at boot time as early as possible before the, the processor, uh, before the CPU is even visible to the system so then you know, nothing else is scheduled on it yet. And I can also do it at runtime. Why is it so critical to be able to do it at boot time? Can you imagine if you have a bug? What if the bug is in the MMU? The first time you enable the you know, the MMU uh, something, if the bug is there, it's so severe, I think they will probably recall the processor, but <laughs> if they would really like to work around it, 
if they give you a workaround, they would like you to execute that as early as possible before anything is scheduled to run on that processor. So that's why I think that is so critical. Actually, because of that, AMD was willing to consider using, you know, allowing uh, uh, operating systems to do the micro update. Before that was possible, AMD wouldn't even consider it. They kept saying it's too late. By the time you guys type on the command line, it's way too late. You know, you can't really walk, wor uh, work around any bugs. So, LMMU and your internet with, uh, with mapping all, those are, LMMU has been around forever on Spark. It's, it's this controller that is just like MMU but for IO so that we can isolate files and DMA and interrupt. So, it's most interesting for device drivers and, uh, and for virtualization. Extended APIC. Currently, on x86 systems, if you don't extend it, there, is, there are only uh, eight bits, one byte, to represent the CPU ID, so that limits you to how many processors? 128 CPUs, not many. So if you want to build very large systems, you need a new mechanism to extend that. So other tuning, we, we tune the performance to death. We actually really work with Intel on this. They give us code, we we'll play with it, we we'll do the benchmarking, and then we tell them, no, no good, and then they will do it again. So back and forth, we improved a tremendous amount of uh, performance. Modern than MWay is another good one. So before, when a processor is idle, we issue a halt instruction. That's also called the C1 state. What do you need to do? Just uh, imagine, what do you need to do if you want a processor to do some work again? So since it's halted, so first of all, the unhalted CPU will have to go stop whatever it's doing. First of all, stop everything and then poke it. Come on, wake up, wake up. So that processor will have to say, oh, okay, I'm awake, execute something in interrupt context, and then go to do some work. So both the CPU that's poking the halted CPU and the halted CPU itself will have to basically raise time to, in this interrupt context, just to get work done. So a my monitor and M weight is a really, really versatile SSD 3, I believe. Instruction, what that instruction allows you to do is that before a CPU goes to sleep, it will just say, I'm interested to see any transaction to that memory address. So if anybody touches it, re you can specify read or write, wake me up. So, and then it would just go to sleep. And if it hasn't been woken up, say, for a while, it can go to deeper and deeper sleep states. So it saves more and more power. And as soon as somebody, so if you want to wake up that processor, you just need to touch that memory area. And it will bang, wake up, and start executing code. So it doesn't have to do anything in the interrupt context. It's really good instruction. Not only we save uh, improved performance, uh, we save a tremendous amount of uh, power. So, really, really good for laptops. I think this slide is messed up. Oh, okay. He wants to display one at a time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we already covered that. I think he wanted to talk over this one by one, but we have already talked about it. Oh, it's one slide. It just took a while to load. I never really understood what, why, what this uh, stunned biker doing that stun has anything to do with uh, Lipsy optimization. But <laughs> It's a curious choice. I guess it's really cool. So uh, there are a lot of new instructions. So we worked with Intel, you know, improved the Lipsy uh, performance. So now we have so-called this hardware capability. If we, we can look at using CPU ID instructions and look at the processor and say, are you an AMD? Are you um, not even necessarily AMD and Intel? Are you SSD uh, compatible? Uh, do, are you capable of SSD? Are you capable of SSD 2? Are you capable of SSD 3? And then we dynamically mount the right libc for the best performance. So that way, uh, when a new, like Intel, is really motivated because they have all these new instructions, they wouldn't be limited by other companies' ability to keep up. They can just uh, improve the libc library and then give us a new hardware capability library and then we can just mount that on that particular platform. So that allows optimization for certain platforms really, really trivial. So that, you know, 
because wouldn't that be sad if they have all these instructions if we have only one Lipsy library and all the other processors are not capable of it, you know. They might refuse to implement them. If that's the case, then, you know, the other companies might refuse to, to implement it just to stop you know, Intel from gaining any performance that way. So. This is a really good one. I actually have a, I don't have time, I guess. I have some really cool slides that uh, about the power aware dispatcher. Okay, yeah. I can probably just talk of this slide. So, are, are you guys uh, familiar with P states, power states? Very good. So, when all the processors are not completely idle. You can, if you want to save power, you can actually scale the frequency down. When you're at lower frequency, the performance is slow. However, you can save power. Why is that interesting? If you know PG&E is telling you I'm going to charge you hundred dollars per watt, you know, you maybe you'll be like, yeah, I guess I would be willing to run a little slower so that I don't have to pay you know a million dollars a day. So, so that's why there's always a price. So sometimes you know people would say. No, I would never want to save that little money. But there's, you know, everybody has a price. So, with all these, that's four, uh, is three. So with all these, actually most interesting is two. With all these, uh, these states combinations of these states, we'll be able to give the c uh, customers the ability to say, do I want to optimize for performance or do I want to optimize for power? I have a really good slide that I really want to show you guys. How do I get out of this one? Can you bring up the tap slide? Well, since Max is not here, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, spending a little bit more time on this particular one because I won't have a chance to, to tell you. So if you want to lo know more, you can definitely go to the tes uh, Tesla website, the open source website, and then go look for a Tesla project. So before this power wear dispatcher, how does power ma management done on, on Solaris? So on the left, as I mentioned, we have a dispatcher that's always optimizing for performance. When it sees, when it, uh, when it has to schedule a thread, it always tries to figure out where I can place it so that it can run the fastest. And the power management framework, on the other hand, how did, how did that thing? The power management framework, on the other hand, is always trying to say, can I power the system down? Can I save some power? Can I power the system down? So before power power dispatcher, what it does is that every 15 seconds also, it will go look and say, are you all idle? Yes, you are. I'll power you down. And it won't, won't look at it for another 15 seconds. So if you have some threads that have to run, you'll be running at like the lowest possible you know, uh, speed. And it takes forever for the power management framework to wake up and realize, oh, I actually need to wake up. There's like this trading thing that I must do. You know? But you know, by now, 15 seconds later, whatever money that you were hoping to make you know, is all gone. So it's n not working really well. So what's the objective? So in the age of team, at the age of uh, teamwork, uh, not teamwork, teamwork, you know, all these uh, so-called individual heroism is no good. Must go. So what? Uh, what the power word dispatcher? The objective is is that the power management framework and the platform framework will provide information such as how you, how all the processors are related to each other to the dispatcher. And it also has a policy governor in the power management framework to tell the dispatcher whether it wants to optimize for power or it op wants to optimize for, uh, for performance. So that way, since it's all po uh, policy driven, the customer can specify it to their heart's uh, content. You know, like for example, all the Wall Street customers that we talk to say, during between, be, be, you know, during the trade hours, don't even try to save me a single wall. I want to run it as fast as it possibly can. 
and, uh, and for all the other people, especially the, like the web server people, they were like, yeah, just you know, run it, you know, tolerable, and you know, save me as much power as possible. So, so that the right side is the policy governor, and the left side, the kernel, uh, when it places the threat onto the dispatch queue, it will notify the power, the, the this policy governor, to let them know. Yes, you know, now you have work to do. No, now you don't have work to do. Now you are totally idle so that you can do whatever you want. So, so that's the objective of, the, of this uh, power where dispatcher. Yes. Yes, very good. Yes, so it is time. So you should, yeah. So uh, once again, you saw this really cool picture. So in this picture, oh, it's the wrong picture. So now you can see how exactly does that work. So in this picture, all those, all uh, eight CPUs are in the same power, uh, so-called active power domain, which means that all eight of them have to be scaled up and down at the same time. So you cannot say have, say, CPU 0 running at you know, 3.4 gig and CPU 7 running at 2.4. You can't do that. So that's uh, why all s uh, eight of them are in the same so-called active power domain. And core 0, they share those pipelines. So all those information are for the dispatcher so that it knows that when you have two compute bound uh, uh, threads, you don't place them on the same core. And the bottom is the C state. Uh, also called the idle state. So what that shows is that each core can go into a deeper C state together. So what are the uh, different C states? They are the also called the idle power state. So C0 is like running, you know, 100%. C1 is when it's running halt or a monitor and wait, you know, the equivalent. C2 is when you actually turn off the clock. And C3 is when you not only turn off the clock, but you can power off some cache. So as you can tell, the deeper C states you go, the more power you save, but at the same time, it would take longer to get out of it. So it's a balancing act. You have to be really careful. Under what circumstances you will want to put them into a deeper C state and when you don't want to. So all that is also uh, governed by a so-called workload um, characterization which is still ongoing. It's, it's going to require a tremendous amount of work. It's really interesting. If any of you want to participate, go to Open Source and take a look at the Tesla website. It's really interesting work because how do you know? How, how do you know how long a thread will run? Or is it a transient thread? You know, it will just run for a split second and it disappears? Because if that's the case, maybe it can just run at a lower speed. There's no, way, no need to bring it to the top speed. So all of those are just research areas that we really need to spend more time you know, to study and characterize so that this, this uh, whole policy you know, driven model will work really well. Because on one hand, you know, we, we would like the customers to have that ability, but on the other hand, we would like to be able to make intelligent decisions for you so you don't have to fine tune every single thing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the which do I expect which one to be a subset? Yes, it's actually possible. Yes, you can turn off the. So those are the seeds. Yeah. So you can actually turn off half. However, since they all share the same L3 cache, you cannot put them into like the deepest, which is C6, that w where you completely turn off everything. So uh, back to the slide, there's some hardware uh, interfaces, like the ACPI interfaces. That's well, actually what we call to turn them off. So that actually issues ACPI calls to turn off the core itself. So it's, um, does that answer your question? So it's both software. So the software will say, you can go power it off now. And then it will make this ACPI call and it actually powers it off. The policy is all software. Yeah. Right now, we don't just have a heuristic, you know, one policy. That's why I said the workload characterization is so interesting. So, yes.
Yes, definitely. But I think currently we only have one policy, that, that which is why it's still an ongoing project. Um, well, I guess I misunderstood the question. We use ACPI calls to turn off uh, components. The question, the question is Not yet. Okay. So the question was, does the policy react to the current ACPI events, uh, ACPI events currently? So the answer is not yet. Sorry about that. Misunderstood your question. But I was really like thrilled that you asked that particular question because yes, we do use the ACPI calls to turn them off. So I interrupted you. So the, this, this is what uh, it would look like if you are scheduling for performance. You know, if you have four threads, we'll spread them out across two sockets. Yes. You can have two threads running on that. However, if they are hyper threads, they share the same execution pipeline. So effectively, only one can be executing. At, at one time, so that is design. That's like that kind of design is best for if one thread tends to block on a memory access, so it, it will stall anyway. So the other thread can actually use the pipeline. But if both threads, four threads running on this one socket. That's correct, yes. Through, going through those pipelines, but you can have all of them, like you can have eight is, you know, issues in, like, say, the, pa the fetch stage of the execution. Okay. So this is how you would uh, schedule it for performance. And if you would like to schedule it for power, you, would, you know, if you would like to be able to, say, put that whole sock into really, really deep uh, C states, you actually place them all on the same socket. So all that is governed by the uh, policy. So it's very interesting. And you might ask, how much power does it really save you? So this is when we're running spec JDE. So when the uh, system is idle, we can save about 50, 60 watts. So that's like 40, 40 percent, 30, 40 percent. What does it mean by 100% throughput? If it's 100% busy, how can you possibly save any power? So if you read that again, it says at 100% throughput, which means that that's as high as it can ever go. But it doesn't mean the CPU is like executing at 100%. So the CPU will still stall to save for memory access and, and such. So that's, that's why when I first looked at the number, I was like, what, you yeah, have 100%? Are you kidding me? You're still saving power? But see, even at 100% throughput, we are able to save how many watts? 20, 30 watts? Not bad, huh? So, so back to the, uh, the other one. I think I'm out of time. But uh, can, you bring, can you help me bring the other slide back? It's not a map, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But, but I'm very close. I think I cover all the most interesting, uh, key, the key points that we, we have been working together for. I'll try to wrap it up in four minutes. Yes. Yes. That's an excellent, excellent question. So the question is, what if I have four uh, database threads that are sharing a lot of data? So if you can actually fit all that information in L3 cache, it's better to put all those four threads on the same socket. We actually do that, and that's 
in the picture I, I probably didn't show you, but the two sockets, there are actually two different NUMA nodes. So when we allocate the threads originally, if they all four are allocated on the same socket, okay, I will, I will refine my uh, statement later. So they will try to stay home, so-called, stay in a home L group, localization group, pretty much as long as they possibly can, unless that lo all those uh, processors are so busy that there is no chance for them to run. Yeah, they would move. Right. But yeah, but they will all try to stay home. Yeah, but they will all try to stay home. However, the question really is, so once you have allocated, you will try to stay home, no problem. But uh, when you're first uh, allocating them, when you're first putting them on the CPU, where do you place them? That's really your question, right? And that's why this world load characterization is so critical, because right now we don't know. We actually try to spread them out, and as a result, we are seeing degradations for certain performances. But it's really hard for a general purpose dispatcher to make that kind of decision that will work well for pretty much any uh, application. So that's why we would like to have a, this so-called workflow character characterization project is that we would like to capture the, the way that certain workloads work and then recognize that next time when that kind of threats come in that we'll know, oh, this type of threats will tend to share a lot of data. And if the data is, you know, can all fit in L3, it's really beneficial to place all of them in the same socket. But that's not done right now. You know, you can actually, pro you know, manually say generate processes set and try to lock all the threads on the same socket, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But currently, the, the dispatcher doesn't have that ability. Yes. Yeah. You can, yeah. Yeah, I think for yeah. Yeah, so when we yeah. So currently that's pretty much what we're trying to do, but not as well. So what if you have what if that particular process has sixteen instead of eight threads? You know, things like that. So we actually like spread them out instead of you know, trying to say all eight of you, all sixteen of you stay on this one core even though you know that it has only Yep. Yes. Yes. Right. <coughs> yeah, so it's, it's a tricky, it's really difficult to find a policy that works well for all benchmarks. Like that sounds really, really good, but then like when they put some, yeah, some benchmark on it and it's just like, that's like terrible and so. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes. So, so yeah. Let's um, let, let's take that offline so that I don't keep everybody here, and I'll try to run through the rest to see if. Uh, It's uh, kind of hung here. <laughs> but th the next uh, important thing is the virtualization. But since I'm not a virtualization expert, I, I don't think I want to pretend I am and uh, make you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the new Intel processors does offer all kinds of hardware support for, uh, for you know, entering, exiting SMM mode. So it's much, much faster than all the emulated uh, implementation. So there were a lot of, uh, Max has a lot of slides on virtualization. You guys are all welcome to look at them. And if you have any questions, feel free to send James or me email and I can direct you to the right group. Um, so 
I'm going to just summarize uh, the presentation. So, Nehalem and open source, especially open source, because all the new features were first going to open source. So, Nehalem and open source is a really, really, really good combination. And this is, let me give you an example of why I'm a true believer. So, currently, I, so I maintain a bunch of build servers, uh, essence, just so that I can, uh, you know, I can sort of see how our customers feel, you know, managing the system. So, before Nehalem came out, I have a Galaxy 4 um, M2, what's that called? 4600M2 uh, system with quad-core processors. So I have 32 CPUs. That was the, like the sweetest box ever. I can do a complete Nevada build with Shadow, which means uh, compiling with both Sun Studio and GCC with Lint. I can do that in an hour and 13 minutes. I'm quite pleased with that. I think that's a good performance. And then I got hold of a Nehalem dual socket, Nehalem system. And guess how long it took for the same operation? 48 minutes. So currently, it is the record holder in my book. And I can't tell you how much I love it. And I already submitted all kinds of requests to every single pos person that I could possibly find saying, when we build the eight socket system, you know, each socket has uh, qua not qua core, eight cores. Each core has uh, two threads. When that system comes out, please, please buy us one. And then they, my boss was like, are you crazy? That's like a million dollars. I said, well, you know, it never hurts to ask. So, <laughs> so uh, if you guys are in the market for build server, definitely do some evaluation. I really, I think it's really, truly an amazing boss, an amazing technology. So thank you very much. I hope I do, uh, I, I did max justice. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Right, well, we'll take a quick morning tea break, morning coffee break, uh, and back in 15 minutes, and then it'll be Sherry again, but she'll be talking about x86 Fast Reboot. Right, thank you very much. <laughs>